This is On Mind with Andrew Archer, welcoming back Angel Uribe. Thanks Oops. for coming in again. Uh, last time, you know, we were talking about uh, your clinic, Stages of Change. You've been doing this for 25 years now, working at um, alcohol moderation with people, chemical dependency, giving people tools to understand that and assist them. Um, so we can talk more about that, but I just wanted to start maybe a little more personal in terms of your background, yeah. family, upbringing, kind of how you got um, to where you're at now. Last time we focused more on the professional yeah. side of it, but just for listeners to be able to see you as, you know, a real person and yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. And I'm, I'm just excited to be back here with you again. I just, our conversations yeah. are, are good. I really enjoy them. Yeah. Um, so just a little bit of my background. You know, I actually am not from Minnesota. I was actually born in California. Um, my dad is um, first generation from Mexico. Um, my mom is originally from California. And, you know, my early childhood experiences, I now understand fully shaped how I ended up where I'm at, but I mm -hmm. never could have seen it if I would have tried to visualize it, right? Yeah. Um, so early life for me was pretty difficult, chaotic. And, and um, you know, I, I say often like, you know, there are family lines out here that people have that are, um, you know, strong in certain lines, right? You have your, your families that have strong uh, athletic genes and mm -hmm. you have some that What's have... kind of prioritized right, and things. Right, yeah. yeah. And it's like you, you just see a lot of certain kinds of things in different family lineages. And so mine was always addiction. Um, that was always something that from a very young age, I, I just, there was no way around it. Mm. And the interesting thing for me was... Um, Every, I've lived with each one of my my maternal family members um, as a as a young person um, as a result of this, mm. and every single so one of problems, them, yeah, yeah, every single one of them had maladaptive patterns or or toxic patterns around chemical use, and it was a different substance for each one of them, and so really early on, I got an understanding that it's not really a substance. Each one of them thought they were doing better mm -hmm. than the others, but as a person living under that, I recognize, no, actually, no, nobody's doing better here. We're mm -hmm. all struggling. And, and it's how you treat the substance, right? right? It is, and it's how, it, it's the, um, it's a really interesting thing that, I, that I've watched over the years where people like to classify and qualify their substance of choice is this is better, this is worse, mm -hmm. this is hard, this is soft. And, you know, well, I, I told my up, mom, everybody right, binge drinks everybody in college. Everybody does it, right? <laughs> and so those patterns that I witnessed early in life, well, as most of us do, we just, I tried it on. I tried, you know, tried it on for yeah. myself. And, um, and so my early years, my teen years and my early 20s, you know, I, I created some, some unhealthy patterns myself. Mm -hmm. And so from that, you know, mid twenties standpoint, I kind of got into my professional career and started my career as a probation and parole officer. So there wasn't, there wasn't to be you already all had of real that. Like, but you had real world <laughs> yeah, experience but already. Real world but so experience. if we go back a second, yeah. because one of the things I focus on in psychotherapy with my patients is when did you make these kind of existential commitments? Like, decisions you might not know the day but mm -hmm. did you make any kinds of big commitments based on seeing that in your family history and obviously the disruption like i'll always do this yeah. or i'll never do that or like yeah oh i had a lot of a lot of hard lines um okay. based on my my early experience and and my my life has been basically unlearning and those hard lines, so to speak, because mm -hmm. the reality of it is, is that things are operating in shades of gray for all of us all the time, you know, and wherever we have inflexibility or intolerance or, or even just being too loose or too uh, blasé about something, we're usually operating out of balance, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so yes, I actually, you know, early on had created some pretty strong, um, Things that I would say that now I look back and I'm like, oh, that's that was just as toxic as everything else, right? Mm. Like when I was in my youth and I was in my period of drinking heavily and and um, things like that, I would often say, 
I drink to not function, whereas I observed my family members at the point where they were drinking or using to function. I see. Right? And so that was one of the things that I would say to myself they had that like a would dependency allow on me. It. They had yes. To, yeah. And it excused me from having to be introspective about my own relationship mm. that I was you were creating. Just not like them. Right. Yeah. And I'll, and that was all that was the only qualifier mm -hmm. that I had set for myself was whatever I end up doing, however however this ends up for me, I just don't want to be like that. Yeah. And I think a lot of us get into that, especially if we've come from an, an unhealthy, you know, youth experience where mood altering chemicals are concerned. Right, yeah. For for my adolescence it was alcohol and my parents mm -hmm. almost never drank, or if they yeah. did drink, it was like one drink, so it was not connected with them. It was it was a very religious upbringing, mm -hmm. so I think much of it was to try and, you know, calm those voices, yeah. those critical voices in our head, or just to kind of escape and be free mm -hmm. of that um, conditioning, but it wasn't from observing, you know, like an alcoholic yeah. parent or drug addict of any kind. It was just a way to kind of free myself from that yeah and that's essentially what we're all seeking is freedom from yeah what right it's just um when we you think about you know and i do my classes i'll always i'll ask you know um i'll have them do an exercise on benefits around using which yeah. is always stumps people because they're like well well there aren't any benefits and i'm like well actually to the tune of 13 years in business and 19.1 million Americans <laughs> struggling, like I'm, I beg to differ, right? If yeah. there weren't any benefits, we're not. We're pretty logical to the extent that we're not going to put ourselves and invest in things that don't reward us in mm -hmm. some kind of a way, right? And so I'll, you know, sit with my clients and I'll ask them, you know, so, so what do you, what is the feeling you get from the benefits that you've identified that come from using or you know involving ourselves with mood altering chemicals and ultimately what it comes down to is freedom mm -hmm. it's that care free um, and and so we talk about okay well what what you're essentially talking about is peace of mind right? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then so that yeah. how could we achieve that in other you know ways that are a little bit more um, yeah because you feel good when you have based. peace of mind right yeah. right because right. mm -hmm. that's what we all really want because it's it's the it's the chronic exhaustion that we're feeling mm -hmm. from whatever the thing is right yeah that's and, kind I, of, and we felt yeah. that way when we were little kids and we yeah. didn't have all this condition 100%. we were free and um, I've talked you know on this podcast about Zen, and it's really going back to when yeah. we were free. You yes. know, we came out of the the womb basically wild and free and creative, and of course <laughs> rebellious. And, <Yes. laughs> you know, yeah. you don't want kids biting each other. You know that right, kind of so. Right. So you you <laughs> have no to unfortunately <laughs> yeah. domesticate because you yeah. we don't live in the the wild and the trees and and mm -hmm. stuff um, anymore. But you were saying, you know, then into your twenties, something. Mm -hmm something changed or was that when yeah. you were saying well i just i just drank to kind of check out or, or what changed then yeah well we're, and we're getting career, into the stages of change yeah for, gonna, for yeah, yeah stages of change as it relates to angel's behavior um yeah so that i part of the reason why i started the evolution um was was career driven, right? Because you graduate from college now, people have expectations that you're going <laughs> to do right. something with what you what you went to school for. And um, and so I, I started in my career and kind of there was a knowing, right? Like, okay, time to button up. You need to, you know, get yourself right and, and do the do the professional thing. And the other thing is I I was removed from my environment because I went somewhere else to work. Mm -hmm. And so it was just me there and kind of had to build anew. And so the the process of changing my relationship was not necessarily something where I just like came to a conclusion and I was just like, this is what I'm doing. I know mm -hmm. I need to examine what motivated me to have the patterns. It was partially the career that kind of got me in in the mode of thinking about it but it was actually the the experience that happens after you sort of stop using alcohol as your primary way of mm -hmm. de-stressing or whatever it's because you're left there with this feeling like well I'm I feel like I should be doing something else, but I don't really, feel I don't really know what's going point. on here. I feel a little imbalanced, yeah. right? So that process is one that just, it kind of started from there. Um, and uh, and 
over the years working in probation and parole, I, we kind of talked about this last time, I, I felt like I was at the end of the line. Like, I'm like, why are we waiting so long to help people, you know, kind of figure things out? It's all downstream. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I'm like, there's got, there's something higher, or at least I'm, I'm intended to be further upstream when I'm, when I'm working with people. And so moving over into doing treatment counseling, you know, that was again, okay, that's, that's a, that's a step up. We're getting there before they're going to prison and stuff. Okay, that's yeah. great. Um, but I'm still feeling like we're a little too downstream. And so the that, that understanding kind of always was making me seek, how do we connect earlier? And how do we help yeah. people while they're still able to self-correct, right? Mm -hmm. And help them. It's not so reactionary, yeah. preventative. Yeah. yeah, and I think the, I think the greatest... Um, like aha for me was uh, realizing that, you know, even in what we consider, you know, th the circles of addiction, right? People say the powerlessness is the essence of it, or that that is that is the place you have to arrive at this understanding. The rock bottom kind of situation. The rock bottom yeah. situation, yeah. One of the things that kind of stuck with me um, after it kind of hit me in one of my, you know, the rabbit hole like thinking times that I do yeah. was. There's no magic in this. It's not magic because people who have been at the the brink of you know everything is lost and gone, but their breath have been able to get themselves back, right? Yeah. And and to build back better when as they're moving through life. Mm -hmm. So if that's true, there's a, then powerlessness is not the act. It's not a thing. Yeah, because we're resilient we beings. Are. You know, we adapt to situations. I've talked about that yes. in, in other shows, and you know that's why I like your. Um, your clinic's name, business name, stages yeah. of change is, uh, you know, I'm in more of the psychotherapy realm, but it's like you go into therapy, you do some work, and then you leave, yes. and then you come back. It's, and it depends on if you're a little kid or you're an adolescent or in your 20s, you're married or end of life kind of stuff. Is that we're in and out of therapy, and I think unfortunately, uh, there's a little bit of a an illusion around the concept of mental health because it's almost like. You know, with like physical health, you can like measure it. You yeah. can measure your blood, yeah. your muscle mass, all these different things. But like mental health, there's no um, measurement uh, right. for it. So it's it's this kind of oblivious plateau that doesn't exist. But I mean, obviously, if like you're suicidal or you know your life mm -hmm. is falling apart, I mean, it relates to that. But there's no clear kind of narrative or path or what does it mean to be kind of healthy with yeah. that um and and that's where i think you get into a lot of interventions and mm -hmm. fix for example we talked about last time like client-centered okay yeah. we, we don't have a judgment about what drugs mm -hmm. you're using or you know what's happening is you tell us what what you want to change yes. that's going to make your life better how you're going to get well yeah. but i think a lot of uh clinicians get hung up on okay i got to change this person i yeah. got you know i'm i'm responsible for this person and i i don't i don't feel that way i'm responsible you know, different ethical things to do in the session in contact with people but we can't control people i mean Absolutely not. you have kids you know you can't control people so there's no point in trying to control them but you have yeah. boundaries and you have a, a contract for the relationship and so I don't know what direction I'm going here, but what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Oh yeah, hundred percent. And when I chose the name Stages of Change Center, is it's because of that understanding, like reaching that point where you're like, you listen, we're it's we're always just ebbing mm -hmm. and flowing, right? It's like and, you're going up and down yeah, stairs. <laughs> yeah, it is. And and my thing is, it's it's in that fluidity where we actually find that peace. All right, it's mm -hmm. like it's it's in the knowing that my humanness is fallible there's like that that's a piece of this yeah but there's also an opportunity in every minute to to you know change the trend or shift mm -hmm. the direction and with a little bit of information and a willingness to tie it to my truth like i can evolve and grow and just because it's not a hundred percent in every direction all the time it's it doesn't mean that i'm not improving it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that progress isn't being made and the thing about you know the stages of change wheel was so good because i use that to i teach my clients the stages of change wheel um and the trans theoretical model of change because i'm like here's the thing as a clinician it makes it super easy for me to work with people right mm -hmm. it's a circle you got your pre-contemplation your contemplation all of that yeah but if i can show my client what that looks like and how their life fits mm -hmm. into that, you're equipping them with tools that allow them to sort of 
feel empowered mm -hmm. to embrace or become or or move in any direction that feels best for and them. And with a you know, circle, there's no finality to it. Exactly. You're just moving backwards and yeah. forwards around it. Um, yeah. And that kind of um, illustrates the point you're making. Right. And I also, like, when we talk about the stages of change, I, I you know, I go through the process of, you know, how the brain, we're, we're in a constant perpetual state of change from the time we're conceived till the time, you know, we transition out. Yeah. And so it's such a naturally occurring phenomenon. And yet it's such a, a struggle sometimes for people mm -hmm. to to embrace, right? But I'm like, actually, it's not really. It's just that we've never really been taught the process for change mm -hmm. and to understand how our yes, mm -hmm. how our specific, you know, ways of thinking or processing or whatever affects the way we go through our process. But it's not. It's uh -huh. it's it's something that. If you understand the principle of it, and you and you're willing to kind of do the self exploration, mm -hmm. you'll find your way, right? Yeah. And this is why I never tell people. I'm like, I'm not here to tell anybody not to drink or not to do drugs, even if I know that for that person, it's probably best to arrest their use for for a period of time, or maybe best, you know, for for you know a, a number of reasons, health reasons, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. It's not my job. It's not my life. Yeah, yeah. Right? I'm there to guide and, and to help facilitate to motivate them to get well. for yeah. them to change what, what this, is important to them. You know, obviously you have a lot of educational experience, clinical experience. Mm -hmm. You've been doing this work for a long time. You're independent, which means you're making your own choices about right. it, which I like, versus yes. being forced into certain ways of being. And I assume part of your personal journey um, is captured in, in your book Beyond the binge that, yeah. that they can people can find this on your website right yeah yeah can you talk about the book a little bit absolutely so um you know kind of the evolution of kind of identifying as an alcohol moderation coach um it has been in the fact that the stages of change center essentially has been the practice of right moderation management because uh -huh. i'm not in the business of telling people you can't do that or you know that you can't you shouldn't do that or whatever but it's only been a couple of years that I finally kind of understood like, oh, this is what I've been doing. Now, how can I bottle this? Because throughout the years, people, words, yeah. Yeah, people are like, you should have a podcast. You should write a book. You should do that. And I'm like, well, but, but what would that look like? And so a couple of years ago, I, I started working with some coaches who are just phenomenal and um, started kind of really pulling a vision together for myself. And um, so over the last couple of years, I've been creating courses and stuff for people, like a mini course um, that's called the Five Day Drink Less Express um, um, Blueprint, right? Mm. And from that, I thought, well, an, an ebook would be great because it just continues the conversation, right? And people learn and take in information differently. So yeah. the ebook is, um, is you know the beyond the binge is kind of like achieving freedom right that's kind of the the name of it through through mindful drinking and so um what i love about it is that i'm outlining like my six step reset so everything that i'm that i've crafted um is based around a six step reset and uh, and it's and it's born out of the word change right and so um my five day you know video course with the workbook mm -hmm. is talking about my six steps to resetting and reframing your relationship with alcohol. The ebook is outlining all of that and, and giving the reader an opportunity to kind mm -hmm. of dive in and understand like from my perspective. Yeah. It, yeah. And they all, they complement each other, right? Because it's, it's, this process is good whether my client is seeking to be, you know, to be able to drink in moderation or if they're actually looking for intentional abstinence and trying to kind of, you know, figure out their pathway for that. Mm -hmm. It's to me, it's 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 an opportunity creating like book that is going to, you know, give you the reader a little bit more insight into how I have come to to the place of working with people like this and feeling comfortable and confident that this is this isn't to be. I'm not out here to try to replace mm -hmm. treatment programming or to say that, you know, support, you know, bar industry or anything like that. <laughs> it's it's that space in between for me. And so the ebook was kind of like, how do I how do I speak to the spaces in between? Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. one of the things that I have 
identified with my clients over the years is that the relationship that they've created with their substance of choice, the the problems come in when they start finding the space in between the extremes in their behavior difficult to occupy. And so as I created my my ebook and my mini course, it's like I want to speak to the space in mm -hmm. between, right? How do we create more more peace and and clarity in the space because at that point you can start making decisions that are more intentionally driven, more mm -hmm. responsive instead of reactive in life. Yeah, yeah, and so it's it's based on um, mindfulness-based mm -hmm. strategies. Mm -hmm. And maybe can you give an example or uh, a story, kind of illustrating one or some of the strategies in the book? Yeah. So the the change is kind of set up around the the acronym. Um, that first we have to clarify. The problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, hold space for discomfort. Um, the the A is the uh, addressing uh, patterns and motivations. Um, the N is then we neutralize the triggers, right? And uh, the G is uh, we set some goals, and the E is you embody whatever it is for you, right? You embody being a mindful drinker or you embody intentional abstinence. Mm. At the end of that, just, you know, that change process, then it's freely up to you. You get, it's that, that's where you start to experience freedom, right? Is in knowing that you've moved through process, that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I have a client that I have been working with and, um, we've been working together now for like three months and his goals, when he reached out to me, he said, you know, I, I really want to figure out how to, how to drink, you know, mindfully or, or to moderate my drinking. Right now mm -hmm. I'm drinking every other day. I can't figure out how to stop and change the pattern on my own. And I'm hoping that with some support, I think you might be able to, to help me, um, uh, you know, meet that goal. And so we start working together and the, the process is just, it kind of happens over and over again with my clients, right? It's, it's the, um, it's the struggle first to kind of figure out what the missing pieces are for themselves in that mm -hmm. moment. And, and it's, it, it's coming full circle around to understanding, like, if you will take the time, right, to invest in yourself, to, to get clear with what it is that's going on and to hold the space and, I, and let me hold it with you to, to figure out how to, how to identify the, the triggers and neutralize them and do the thing. The outcomes for people is is fantastic. I mean, uh -huh. this current client and I, you know, as we've talked about in the last few months, his ability to go from being the every other day drinker to actually recognizing that since January 1, he's had 12 days of drinking mm. where he questioned what was what was behind the, the way that he drank. And I look at him and I'm like, do you recognize this, the, the, the power that is in that? Mm -hmm. Is that that belief structure that he came in with was, I cannot figure out how to get past two days without having a drink. Yeah. To changing your, your perspective is that actually since January 1, you've had 12 days in which it, you had questionable, you know, and it's not questionable according to, to me. To him. It's questionable to him about... Why was he drinking like that? Or why did he choose alcohol mm -hmm. in that way? Or why did he even choose to drink when he's trying to, you know, go through some days of abstinence? So the beauty of it is, is I see my clients not only be able to drink less and less frequently and less when, they, when, they're, when they're drinking, but it's changing the whole perspective behind it, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. it isn't. It isn't about that. We get so focused on the alcohol that you miss the forest for the trees. Yeah. And so what the success is that my clients experience is that when they stop focusing on the problem mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they start considering that there, are, that there are other perspectives that they can hold that, that offer solutions to what it is that, you know, that they feel challenged by, that is amazing. And my clients have seen 40% reductions in, you know, their amount that they're consuming wow. or the frequency, which is amazing, right? Mm -hmm. if, if from the harm per reduction process, that's that's exceptional, yeah. right? And I see this happen over and over again with my clients. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. um, the beauty of it is, is that mine is just one that I've watched and I've, 
uh, and I've worked with people over the years and just let them lead me to understand like mm -hmm. what's the steps and so those steps have come through from the 13 years now that stages yeah, of yeah. change center has been going on and I've seen a lot of people be able to turn things around mm -hmm. and, um, kind of just a funny add-on story one of the first kind of cute moments I had when I started stages of change I was going through a drive through picking up some you know food for my kids and uh, and I was in a hurry because I had class and all the things right mm. and I pull up and this girl shoots her head out the window and she's like hey and I was like hello and she's <laughs> like she's like you're the lady from stages of change center and I was like Yes, I am. <laughs> I, okay, I'm like, I wasn't expecting you to uh, just, uh. you know, kind of call me out here. And she said, hey, I just want to tell you something. And I said, oh, okay, what's up? And she said, you know, after I took your class, she's like, I kind of kept drinking and I kind of kept doing stuff. And she's like, but then one day I just woke up and I realized, like, what am I doing? And this isn't what I want. Wow. And she's like, I've had 90 days now. I haven't had a drop to drink. Mm. And she's like, you, thank you for helping me do that. And yeah. I was like, no, no. Hold on a second. It was like in that moment, I'm like, no, no, I didn't help you. I just supported your process. You did this. You did the work. I haven't seen you in 90 mm -hmm. days or more, <laughs> yeah. you know. But I said, thank you for sharing with me where you are in your process. Because you, in all of that, it's helped me to clarify what it is that my role is. Right. And We're learning as much as they are. Learning. And, you know, we touched on, you know, I think our shared... Um, perspective on that we're all interdependent you know 100%. we're all connected and in really to simplify your approach what you're saying is you start with a relationship person comes to your office or on phone or zoom okay let's clarify what's going yeah. on with you and then holding the space is like you know you know what's been the history what are yeah. you thinking about you know what have been uh, that's moving into the addressing, you know, the patterns. Um, when do you get triggered? If you walk from, in front of a bar, for, for example, and people are drinking in the summer. Uh, and then the other one was embrace. Um, remind me what that yeah. so embrace. Embody, like what embody. it means to be a mindful drinker or an Oh, yeah, to recognize abstainer. what's happening. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, they decide on their own goal. But so you're creating a relationship with them. They're looking at their relationship to the substance yeah. and, and their patterns, and then they heal their relationships based mm -hmm. on those examinations yeah. of relationships. I want to sh shift gears mm -hmm. um, just a little bit because um, I focus uh, less on the, the patterns and kind of the, the use history with people. And um, I start, call it the second or third uh, meeting with people on... Um, what transactional analysis refers to as time structure, mm -hmm. um, that we're hungry in the same way for food and water and, and alcohol yeah. in terms of craving um, for these things that are kind of natural, but then we're hungry to have our, our time structured. And there's different activities that you can structure your time, uh, work, you know, kind of just pastimes, gabbing about things, the psychological yeah. games I think we can get into. Intimacy is, is obviously mm -hmm. one way, but um, sometimes the, the substance is a substitute mm -hmm. for the, the intimacy with other people. So I want to talk about that, but one other thing, because you, you were talking about the goals as the, the other um, strategy, kind of the final strategy, where like this individual that you talked about decided, well, I'm mm -hmm. an abstain, for, yeah. and then she did it for 90 days. What I'll do with patients, whether it's trying to quit smoking or quit social media, is I use the personality structure yeah. that's in transactional analysis. So the parent, the adult and child, and the parent is like, you know, influenced by your parents, you know. So if if your father drinks a lot, the parent might say, oh, just have one. You know, it's just like <laughs> right. hey, get loose or whatever. But I'll say, okay, so you're talking about drinking. Maybe they're saying, oh, okay, I'm just going to go cold turkey. Mm -hmm. Okay, which part of the personality is that? Well, it's probably the judgmental parent mm -hmm. that's saying, waving their finger like you shouldn't be drinking. Mm -hmm. So the parent part of you, you would say, oh, you got to abstain, zero, mm -hmm. nothing, maybe go to AA or whatever. Yeah. The child part of them, you know, that has this desire, <clears throat> you know, is that little rebel like you talked about in the last conversation is like, well, I want to let loose. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I want to yeah. have 10 drinks. Maybe I want to do it every night. Okay, so that's obviously a young version of you. Yeah. We, we want to take that into consideration because... He or she just wants to play. You mm -hmm. want to have fun. And, mm -hmm. and oftentimes, you know, substances can facilitate that for better or for worse. And so then the other 
state is what they call the adult. And so the adult is more rational, more objective. Mm -hmm. It's from the here and now. Not what your parents would say about it. Right. Not what, you know, a l little version of you wants to do because it's often not appropriate to the present moment. And so we break that down. And yeah, it was the parents saying zero and the child is saying 12 drinks or whatever. It's like, okay, from the adult state then. What, or right. I do the same thing with right. exercise. If people are yeah. wanting to get an exercise, I got to do it every day for 30 yeah. minutes a day. It's like, okay, but you're doing zero now. So let's, right. think, let's think what's like, you know, get yeah. them common sense. Yeah. And so then they'll come uh, to, to a decision more than like a goal because uh, as you know, People come into therapy because this other person told them they should. Right. So then they're just setting up a goal for that wife, yes. husband, partner, old adult son, whatever it is. And it's like, no, what, what do you want to do? Right. You know, and I think that's what you're saying with these strategies. It's very much client centered. They're driving, you know, they're holding the wheel of the car per yeah. se. You're sitting in there with them, yeah. right? You're holding that yeah. space, but not you should do this. You should. Yeah. do that so so think did you want to say something to that? yeah so it's so funny because we talk about like what you're saying we talked about a little bit that dry january the you know doing 30 days of time just to prove that you can yeah right like, <laughs> see i'm not an alcoholic <laughs> i know i can i i've been I able to go 30 time. days I, I you have no idea how often i hear that as the threshold of like so i i quit one time for for two months i quit you know i i, I could do it Okay, I appreciate uh -huh. that. Thank you for sharing that with me. But my question is, what drove you to feel compelled to take those 60 days or 30 days or whatever, you know? And it's a mm -hmm. popular thing. And I, you know, I, 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 I like to be a little controversial now and again with my clients <laughs> just for the purpose of inspiring them to think a little bit differently or to challenge themselves to think a little differently. But, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the 30 days off because most people are not doing any work on themselves to, mm -hmm. you know, even get the clarity to understand why did I have a pattern? It's very hard to just not to do something. You know. Right. And so they focus on getting through the 30 days, but they don't actually figure out how to have any joy in that 30 days or how to how to be able to establish other ways to to be calm or to, you know, re relax or decompress at the end of a day, whatever their mm -hmm. motivation is. Right. Or to feel more comfortable in social settings or whatever the case may be. And so that's one of the things that I say to people is like, listen. I, I I understand, and 30 days sobriety thing, it's a trend right now, and we do sober October and dry mm -hmm. July and dry January. Hey, every month pretty yeah. soon is going to be about that, we right? You put it up on right. social media when you do it. <laughs> right. Get a lot of praise from yeah. it. Yeah. And, but I, and this is the thing is I, I'm, I'm not the person that says, cast that out. Don't do that altogether. But the next time you think you want to do something like that, let's let's not do the parent child thing let's let's actually say you know what well, if the adult in me has which you have data right, then yes you have information, right yeah. how can i take these 30 days and make them more meaningful so that the long-term result stays with me yeah. not you know it's great to take 30 days off but it'd be much better to practice something that's that's more in alignment with you for 365 days mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. even even you know a, a half of that time yeah rather than always going from the constant extreme to the extreme right right, right. because we see a lot of people like they'll take the time off and then they mm -hmm. fall go they go right back into the same pattern well that's what, that's what I did uh, I popped into my head as you were talking um, about kind of the extreme abstinence is I mean, I wasn't necessarily having like a big issue with alcohol, but for my kind of overall health, I decided this was back in 2010 or something like that when I was living in New Hampshire. I was kind of doing some like self discovery, I guess you would say, yeah. and kind of trying to optimize myself, maybe a little too hard, but I got rid of the smartphone because I was living in the woods anyways, <laughs> and it didn't, my Blackberry didn't work. It's like, why do I have this Blackberry? It doesn't even get a signal on me. It's funny now because people's cell phones go off in every single session that I'm in, whereas back then, because they had this little tiny tower, they get, it, you yeah. wouldn't get the phone call anyways. Anyway, so I, so I quit no drops of alcohol for like six years. Wow. And what I actually realized was 
um, that I was just doing that to control, even trying to control myself yeah. even more and actually avoiding situations that I was uncomfortable in because I, I could dismiss it and say, well, there's going to be drinking there. I don't want to yeah. go there. And, and, you know, I focus on Eric Byrne and transactional analysis. And, and he wrote that, you know, the cure for, you know, this, what he called the alcoholic game was not necessarily abstinence from alcohol, but you have to learn how to control yourself socially, especially yeah. when there's alcohol involved, to not keep screwing things up or yeah. having these problems or DUIs or whatever. He saw much more of a relational process. So how I get into that in my therapy is talking about time structure. Okay, what do you do on a weekday? You know, most people have work or they have school and they tell me what time they get up and what they do. And it's typically a lot of structure mm -hmm. to it. Then they get home from work, school, whatever it is, and then there's an absence of that stru um, yeah. structure, time structure. And, you know, going back to those hungers, like we need that stimulation of something. Boredom is very yes. hard on the human animal. Yeah. Um, and so we need <laughs> so stimulation, true. social recognition, and we need some of that time structure. Um, I mean, this is the difference between little kids, right? My three-year-old doesn't say, you know, what are we going to do today? <laughs> she yeah. just goes from A to B to C and doesn't care. Right. Doesn't, it's just like, right. here's what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, but so the, the time structure, what inevitably gets illuminated is, okay, work, 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 uh, busy, busy, busy during the week. Then it's Friday night mm -hmm. and maybe you go party or, or indulge in different, you know, substances. Mm -hmm. But Saturday and Sunday are often um, not structured at all. Right. And so it's like all work and no play during the week. And then it's play. And so you hear people, whether they're dieting or, mm -hmm. or moderating their alcohol, it's like the like weekends are really hard. And I say, well, that's because there's no structure. <laughs> right. So it's really hard for me, right. too. I, I prefer to be in the office. I mean, every day if I could. Okay. Just I love that structure and kind of accomplishment and getting mm -hmm. stuff um, done. But so... I'll often say, like, you might want to structure some unstructured time. I mean, mm -hmm. that that's going to be feel um, better for you. But we're pushed into productivity, of course, and mm -hmm. working constantly. But how do you see that that time structure? Maybe you know it in a different way with with people that you're educating. Yeah, so so good because the reality of it is is that when I've kind of polled my clients, right, to kind of understand what are the things that are driving the misuse or the abuse of a substance, stress boredom, right? And their social environments. Those three yeah. things are the catalyst for so many, <laughs> right. so many things that people are struggling with. And the thing is, is like, as I was thinking in my head, one of my, one of my clients that I work with, he, you know, he goes to work, he does the adult thing. He does the responsible thing all week long. Yeah. And so at Friday, he's, it's like, he's, He's sort of exhausted from tolerating, you know, just getting up and just being about his grind. He's kind of kept that child part right. at bay. Re yeah. Yes, re like suppressed. And what happens is then, you know, the idea is if if he wants to get to the weekend, so that there's no nobody's calling on him, and you know, mm -hmm. there. But then, so he's looking for an escape. He's looking for something. And I told and and what I've tried to kind of help him understand is that, you know, you're not looking for nothingness. You're looking for meaningfulness. Right. You're looking to connect to something meaningful in your life. So when you talk about like the structure piece, right? Absolutely. We need to have a structure that that follows us through our days. It's like mm -hmm. every day is a 24 hour day, right? You right. have to you have to sort of look at it like that and you have to sort of say, what do I need to do today that is meaningful and creates a sense of balance mm -hmm. while I'm doing the adulting mm -hmm. things that I need to yeah. do, right? So that we're not living in the extremes all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Extremely rigid and, and disciplined Monday through Friday and then yeah. Friday through, you know, <laughs> Sunday five o'clock or whenever the game is over, we mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. you know, we just let it just well, I've go. I've already started talking, you know, with my kids a little bit about transactional analysis in terms of the personality and what's going on sort of in here in terms of our social reality. And if you break down that personality structure of the parent adult child, I mean, the parent is basically about work. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's either, you know, the yep. professional work, domestic labor, you know, probably mowing your lawn yep. last weekend, you know, kind of, yeah. it's like, uh, it's stuff we know how to do. Mm -hmm. It's that knowing part of the, that, of course, you can judge people from that, mm -hmm. say, oh, you should do X, Y, and Z. Um, but so we need to work, and the adults say, you know, about being present, we need to learn. Yeah. So like us con conversing, if we're just stuck in our head, we're not going to remember anything, we're not going to learn right. from each other. But then the child, like the example you use, like that person, he basically said, to himself, meaning the, mm -hmm. the child version of him is like, 
you're going to have to stay tucked away yeah. until we get to Friday or Saturday. And then what does that child do yeah. when it comes out? It's like, I don't want to stop wow. now because I'm going to go back into the cage. <laughs> right. you know? yeah. And so it's, I'm, I'm saying to them, okay, you have to work, like whether it's pick up sticks in the backyard <laughs> right. or yeah, take something. the dog out. Yeah. Um, you learn. So mm -hmm. sit down and read a book, mm -hmm. you know, not just uh, watching shows on the computer or the TV. Right. And then play. I mean, kids obviously are, are very good at, you yeah. know, they pick up sticks and then they're doing a war. Or they yeah. have this imaginary little yeah. play thing going on. And, and that's what, you know, we talked a little bit last in our last discussion, I brought up this joylessness, and which connects to your mm -hmm. what you're saying about meaning. Is like if it's just all work and no play, like it's yeah. pretty depressing yes. <laughs> way to live. Yeah. But the the child part of you, that's where you come up with spontaneity, mm -hmm. usually with some fear. Like a lot of times when I work late, it's already established with my partner, my family is like, okay, dad's not coming home until after bedtime. Or mm -hmm. so I have this window of unstructured time. And sometimes I get done with work, you know, 7.30, 8 o'clock on those evenings. Like, I can do whatever I want. Oh my mm -hmm. God, well, that's yeah. kind of scary. It's <laughs> yeah. like, what could I get into? But inevitably I do something spontaneous. Mm -hmm. And so through that, working through that fear of like, what do I do now? Um, mm -hmm. Then you feel joy. So mm -hmm. you do something different or you call a friend, but it's not, it's specifically not structured for me. Right. I know that this is an unstructured block that I can do whatever I want, but sometimes that's like overwhelming mm -hmm. uh, psychologically. And if you're kind of conditioned to avoid that yeah. fear that a lot of my patients, they've adapted that way. It's like, that's scary, I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. No, actually you move towards that fear. And then on the other side is this joy. Yes. This, you know, but what do we do? Yeah. We got unstructured time. TikTok, you know, yeah. scroll, Facebook, yeah. that kind of thing. Versus knowing, okay, it's going to be unstructured. I'm going to have to think and do something. Right, right. You know what's interesting, Andrea? I, so when I was teaching my classes in person, I would have my, my clients do um, an exercise. Um, it was called a picture's worth a thousand words, right? And I would bring out crayons and I'd bring out markers mm. and, I, and, and I'd say, I just want you to draw a picture. Um, that's three sta stages, right? Your past, your present, your future. Um, that would explain your relationship to your mood of, uh, your, your substance of choice. And it, I, month after month, I would do this and you would just see people clam up immediately. And I would start hearing all the things. Oh, I, I, I only draw stick people. Oh, I, I, I can't draw. Can mm -hmm, I use words? Mm -hmm. Can I, you know, we'd go through this process. Well, I started getting fascinated by that. So I started doing a little bit of research and I came across a statistic that said, by the time we reach adulthood, 80% of adults have shame triggers around creativity. And I thought, huh, I wonder if that is playing into this somehow. Oh, yeah. Because what you're talking about is the ability to Well, no, no. To what they creative. say in their head or they say out loud to me yeah. is it's, that's childish. Right. No, no, no. It's childlike. No, it's, it's childlike. Yes. <laughs> it's not it's childish is like yes. a pejorative. It's, it's bad. Yes. It's so true. And so what, what you're describing is like that's scary to people to even be spontaneous or imaginative or to take that freedom right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in and obviously sometimes we have our responsibilities right like you said like the grass does have to get mowed <laughs> yeah. and uh and we do so we have to find time for that but there is an important piece that's missing for a lot of people is the joy and the joy i think the access to that is through our ability to be creative or mm -hmm. imaginative or to come up with things that feel like exciting or Well, because it's the strongest part of the personality right. is like that, you know, because it's those hungers, a desire, obviously physical yeah. attraction and yeah. all the sexual stuff, isn't that? But you can, yeah, you can just yeah. suppress and say, well, I don't need to play. For, for me, it was such a gift with um, raising my kids. The, the first one, of course, is always the hardest because right. right. you don't know what you're <laughs> doing, what you're, you're stressed. But, but I realized <laughs> it's like, wow, I really don't know how to play. Yeah. Or I won't, more so, I won't allow myself yes. to play. And of course, that's all they want to do, especially right. uh, at a young age. So I encourage people to say, rather than saying, I can't, mm -hmm. you know, I can't play, it's bad, et cetera. It's like, okay, no, no, no. Will you go to a movie with your friend on this day or not? Or will yeah. you do this or won't you? And so then they just make a decision, yeah. which has nothing to do with how they were raised. It's like, no, you just will. Right. And it takes you know, just kind of a little bit of practice like anything else. 100%. But of course, the, the reward, rewards in terms of joy and meaning uh, really are born out of that, you know, process. And I want to, you know, just kind of um, talk a little bit about games before 
we um, close out. I, I mentioned to you before uh, the movie uh, that Jeff Bridges is in called Crazy Heart, where he plays mm -hmm. a, a classic sort of uh, alcoholic. He's a washed up country musician, and he meets uh, along the way a journalist, Maggie Gyllenhaal plays the, the character, but he gets into all these problems with, with being drunk. And so if people have seen that movie, or, or you should watch it because it's just kind of a good movie. Anyways, it, <laughs> it, it reveals what, what Eric Byrne and others called the, the game alcoholic. Which the game, um, you know, it could be independent from the person that drinks brandy at eight o'clock in the morning. The person playing this game moves through these different transactions, relational patterns with people and keeps, you know, crashing their car, ending up in detox, getting into fights, what, you know, occupational issues. And so the, the alcoholic, the quote unquote alcoholic, they're in the role of alcoholic, mm -hmm. which, like you were talking about in your personal history, you learn that yeah. from the people closest yeah. um, to you, but there's these other roles. I think it's easiest to understand if you think about the show, the A and E show, Intervention, mm -hmm. is like they interview all the the family members, and you have at least one person that that Byrne would call the Patsy. Mm -hmm. The Patsy isn't going to be critical of your drinking right. or like bring it up. They just, uh, the, you know, the alcoholic comes. You know, I need money, mom, or whoever it is, mm -hmm. and they don't. They don't. They know where that money's going, right? Yeah, right. And, and the, you see it in the show. In the interview, is like I give them money. Is like they enable them. Yeah. Um, but they're not. They're not critical of them. Now, uh, in the movie, uh, you know, Jeff Bridges <clears throat> gets into this relationship with Maggie Gyllenhaal. And he is constantly in this victim mm -hmm. role. Like, you know, he's not taking any responsibility right. for his thinking or his problems. And so what Maggie ends up doing is she either, you know, is very critical of him, uh, what, what um, in my circles they call persecuting. Mm -hmm. They persecute them mm -hmm. or she rescues him. You know, mm -hmm. he's drunk and helps mm -hmm. clean him up and he had this problem. Uh, so you see it as a, as a kind of a, a game process. Oh, the other role, uh, Robert Duvall plays basically his friend um, who owns a bar and is a bartender. Yeah. And he also isn't critical of him, but he's he's a professional. Like, he knows when to cut people off right. from alcohol, but right. he facilitates him going to right. treatment. And, and so he's, he's what's called the connection, mm -hmm. is oftentimes people with these strong dependencies around substances, the person that sees them at the liquor store or the, yeah. the guy that sells them the eighth of pot is like the closest person mm -hmm. in, their, in their life. And so when you look at it that way, you know, if you're just talking with that, you know, Jeff Bridges character, it's like, what is going on inside your head? You're not going to see how these are just maneuvers within this mm -hmm. game that keeps leading to the yeah. same payoff. The payoff is the hangover where the person is super critical of themselves, mm -hmm. just chastising mm -hmm. um, themselves. But can you translate that into any real world, like, yeah. examples? Okay. Every, every scenario. Every scenario. And I should that say happens. that, yeah, the, the, the alcoholic game, I mean, you could, you can also call it the addict game, yes. which is with other drugs. And it's usually a more sinister game, right. more problematic, faster, right. more dangerous. Right. Well, my thing is, I... The, the intervention show to me is just like <laughs> the funniest. I don't thing actually I, endorse that right, way of being, but <laughs> right. And you, but you see it as the most exacerbated version of what the roles are, right? So that it's so evident because it's you know it's a production, right? And mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you really see it overplayed for every single person. Um, that's that's involved in the show, and the thing that I that I say over and over again is um, addiction. However you perceive it, it can't exist without help. It exactly. it has to be supported. Yeah, you can because yeah. because if a person was left completely to their devices while they're in the pattern of of misuse, abuse, mm -hmm. or addiction, it's going to end pretty quickly. Yeah, and and and. Pretty wildly, right? Which is how they leverage right. the person to go to treatment, right? It's like, you can't yeah. live with me. I'm like, not giving I'm you done. any more money. I mean, anymore. it's very obvious, mm -hmm. yeah. Once the enabling stops, things things start to turn into a new direction, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but you're right that every person takes on a role within the dynamic. And this is one of the things I explain to my clients, too. I'm like, listen, 
the people who are in your life, we've got to start having conversations with them about how they need to understand the role they've played in this process. Mm -hmm. Not that they're responsible for the person's behavior it's or choices. It's a family system. It's a system. Yeah. And, and we're all actively playing different roles. And sometimes we play multiple parts and all of those yeah, things, just like you said. And that's even more confusing. But I appreciate what you're talking about is like, what is the reward that the, that the, that the person seeks in that situation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And what most people think is the reward, it's not. It's, it's not that they're wanting to get higher yeah. drunk. Most people, when I when I was working in in my um, parole status, I'd <laughs> believe it or not, I got a degree so I could go watch people pee, right? And so I could, <laughs> like, you know, what? but I but I would be sitting in there doing UAs and stuff, and and they would tell me stuff like, you know, I had a, a lady in particular. She was um, she went to prison for meth uh, addiction and all of that and like the consequences of choices she made there. And uh, she said, you know, Angel, she said, I never enjoyed being high. She's like, the high for me was in the pursuit of the chemical. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I would, I would feel it the most intensely before I did it. I always felt like crap after I did it. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and what you're talking about is that very thing. It's like, you think that it's the high people are seeking. Mm -hmm. No, there is it's a... It's actually the way to structure your time yeah, to figure yes. out how to get... You know, so many people in the show are like, end up homeless or probably, you know, yeah. there's there's sex, doing sex work or mm -hmm. they're panhandling and things. Mm -hmm. And so their whole day is structured yeah. around getting money to pay for yeah. the, the drug. And, and, you know, you were talking uh, for a second about just the show and, you know, it's obviously overproduced and this mm -hmm. thing, but uh, many of the people, because I've, I've watched the show quite a bit, they're actually playing their own games. One right. of them is called, I'm only trying to help you. Yes. And I mean, that's what the interventionist is like. Yes. We're only trying to yeah. help. And so like they have ulterior motives. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you can look at it from that relational perspective. You know, talking about that um, client you had, I mean, that's maybe a, another discussion for us is we criminalize yeah. uh, substance use in this country specifically. Mm -hmm. So many people are in the prison system. It's about it's less than 50 percent have actually mm -hmm. physically harmed another individual right. selling right. drugs using drugs you know doing mm -hmm. a dui stuff like that um that happened when it's it really is a relational problem to some degree a medical problem because if you're yeah. if you're um so dependent on something like mm -hmm. alcohol you just stop it i mean you can die very easily yeah. depending on um, your history, anything you want to kind of add to that? Yeah. So w w when we uh, talk again, I'd love to go in deeper on the whole 80-20 rule. And I and mm. I, I got a conversation when I started in probation work years um, ago. And the the agent I was talking to, she said, she's like, when, once you understand the 80-20 rule, she's like, things will start to make sense. And uh, and and I was like, well, 80, 20, you know, I'm, I was young and my my young self thought I knew everything coming out of college, <laughs> you know, and she started teaching me right away. Yeah. But basically the 80, 20 rule was this. 80% of your caseload takes up 20% of your time, 20% takes up 80%. Yeah, Why? Yeah. It's because 80% of your caseload are there because of drugs and alcohol. Something they did to get it, something they were found in possession of, or something they did while under the influence. Mm. And the reason they only take up 20% of your time is because if you take the alcohol or the drugs out of the equation, they're like us. They, they, they're just trying to be good humans. They're not out there doing the most and you know yeah. hurting people and all of that. They're just trying to do the best they can. The, but so when we we could get into a whole conversation about the the legal aspect and yeah. the consequence of that, because the pipeline from probation to prison doesn't change. It's mm -hmm. still eighty twenty. You well, and the short yeah. version is probably that it's still that old school disease 100%. model. You go to AA, yeah. you abstain. Um, yeah, we'll definitely um, get into that. So. Uh, just to wrap, tell yeah. tell people again, you know, where to find this information, including yeah. your book, and this will be, uh, you know, to be continued, of course. Yeah, yeah. So uh, my website, uh, www.stagesofchangemn.com, and um, that's the best place to go. I will have, um, you know, if you want to take a look at your relationship with alcohol and make some changes or you just want to learn a little bit more about the different services and things that I offer that can support you or a family member that are that's wanting or needing to um, 
to do some things to kind of make some changes in their lives. Um, that's the best place to go. I've got the ebook is there, the mini course is there, um, and uh, and a whole bunch of other information that you maybe didn't even know mm -hmm. that you wanted. <laughs> Well, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming back on. This is Angel Uribe, and this is On Mind with Andrew Archer. We'll see you soon. Thanks.